Okay. Good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to this uh, event to launch the Social Worlds of Nine-Year-Olds report. I'm sure I'm not the only one that was a little bit relieved this morning that the event was virtual and not in person on this particularly wild and windy morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Visser. I'm going to be chairing this morning's proceedings, or rather this afternoon's. Um, I'm the head of research in the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. And one of the real highlights of my day job is, uh, is our involvement with the Growing Up in Ireland study. Um, as you can imagine, we're extremely proud of this flagship project. Uh, and GUI really is one of the richest sources of data and children, uh, data about children and their families in Ireland. And indeed is used by hundreds, if not thousands of researchers to explore diverse range of themes and issues. We're particularly excited about today's report because it's the first time that we've commissioned a report that dives really deeply into the differences between the lives of nine-year-olds 10 years apart. When GUI was established in 2006, as a two cohort study recruiting both nine year olds as well as babies at the time, one of the key objectives was to be able to compare the cohorts to look at how the lives of Ireland's children are changing. So in addition to tracking outcomes for children over time, this cross cohort comparison is a really, really very important part of longitudinal research such as GUI. This is the latest and indeed seventh report in a partnership that the department has with the ESRI. Uh, and that's a program of work that has generated a series of policy relevant outputs over the last few years. The partnership is very important to the department because it allows us to use this GUI data to its best effect. It gives us a better handle on understanding the experience of childhood and how that has changed over time. And indeed the 10 years between 2008 when the babies were born and, 20, and 2018 was a period of significant social and policy change in Ireland. So there were really significant differences between the experiences of the two courts. And that's what this uh, study will explore today. As the minister will refer to in his speech, we're really delighted that earlier this year, government approved a third birth, birth cohort for GUI. So we should be able to do this analysis again in about a decade, looking again at how nine-year-olds are faring uh, as, as they grow up in Ireland. We we'll also have plans to look at how 13-year-olds are going to be doing. So the 13-year-old data will be available very soon, and we'll be able to trace then not only how the two cohorts are comparing, but to really dive underneath uh, the particular trends that are emerging in this report. So before I introduce Emer, who's going to tell us about those trends and give us an overview of the report, we first have a short video from the Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. Minister O'Gorman unfortunately could not be with us in person today, um, but as part of a much wider commitment to the role of research across the department, I think it's fair to say that the Minister is particularly keen for us to use GUI data to understand the policy levers that will drive outcomes for children and young people across Ireland. So I'll just ask my colleagues to show the video there and then we'll proceed. I'm delighted to launch this report, The Changing Social World of Nine-Year-Olds. Thank you to Emer for inviting me and for, for producing this excellent report. Today's report provides us with important insights on how the lives of nine-year-olds have changed over a 10-year period between 2008 and 2018 and with important implications for policy monitoring and development. The report really highlights the important role that both education and extracurricular activities play in shaping children's interests in cultural and in sporting activities. The report also shows that gender and social background differences in children's activities merge early and tend to persist. This suggests, suggests the importance of affordable early learning and care in providing access to a variety of engaging activities for girls and boys across all social groups. In Budget 2023, a landmark 1.025 billion euro in funding was made available for early learning and care and school aged childcare. This will bring transformative change to this vital sector and ensure high quality early learning and care that is affordable, accessible and inclusive. 
important um, we also see recent cultural initiatives such as My Little Library which offers a book bag with books and resources for every four and five year old starting school. This is part of a wider government drive towards fostering a love of books among young children and on connecting those children, their families and carers to the network of libraries nationwide. For my department, a really important consideration is also how to support the parents of young children and this study helps us to better understand their support needs. Supporting Parents, the National Model for Parenting Support Services was published earlier this year. The model sets out a range of commitments to make parents more aware of the services available and to increase access to high quality, needs-led led and inclusive services. I'm pleased to say that the implementation phase of the model is underway, bringing about change for parents and children in Ireland. Lastly, I want to mention, mention how this report really speaks to the value of the data from the Growing Up in Ireland Longitudinal Study, which provides a unique opportunity to compare the lives of nine-year-olds born a decade apart. Earlier th this summer, Government approved the third Growing Up in Ireland cohort, which is planned to commence with parents and infants in 2024. In 2033, this new baby cohort will turn nine years old and we will have the opportunity to see how societal developments, policy changes and investments have shaped and changed their lives compared to the two co cohorts in today's report. Thank you again to Emer and to the URSI and I look forward to hearing the outcome of this event as it promises to be a very interesting webinar. Thank you. Just a reminder, our question and answers function is open, so you can use that if you want to put any questions uh, into, into the list as we go through, and we'll take as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, we have a fairly tight schedule today, so I'm not promising we'll deal with all of them. Uh, it's a very rich report with a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different things in it, but please do put your questions in the Q&A function, and if we don't get them today, we'll make sure we get back to you in the coming days. Now, without further ado, we'll move on to a presentation of the report itself. I am conscious that I don't need to introduce Emer to this audience. Um, as a leading expert on education research and indeed as the principal investigator on GUI, GUI um, I just wanted to say we, we couldn't have come up with anyone better to do this work for us. And we're very grateful to her for her really expert stewardship of this project uh, and the emerging findings. So, so Emer, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Anna. I'll share my screen and I'll rely on you to shout if, if there's any problems. Looks good I, to me. Great. Uh, I just want to begin with some thanks to the Minister for his ongoing support for this research programme and for the kind words he, he just uh, gave about the report and, and the work. I, I'm really grateful to the department for the ongoing research partnership and to Anna in particular, as well as other members of the programme uh, steering group who have kind of worked with us to ensure a close relationship between research and policy. I have to acknowledge my uh, stalwart colleagues in, in the GUI study team who've worked so hard to produce such beautiful data and the families and children in GUI who've really get, been so generous of over the years with their time and input. So um, as Anna briefly mentioned, we can take advantage now of the two cohorts of GUI to look at the experience of nine-year-olds a decade apart. So we're looking at the older cohort, cohort 98, who were nine in 2007 and eight, and we're comparing them to cohort 08, who were nine in 2017-18. And this was a period of very rapid social, economic and policy change. Cohorts were 08 were born on the cusp of the Great Recession. So they really experienced very challenging economic circumstances in their early childhood. And they, they and their families would have been impacted by some of the austerity measures uh, which affected uh, services for them. We've also seen very rapid penetration of digital technology throughout the economy and society. Um, cohort 08 would have benefited from the introduction of the pre free preschool year, but um, they were too old to avail of the expansion of that uh, to a two year program. Both cohorts uh, benefited from the introduction of parental leave, uh, and this was subsequently increased in duration uh, for the younger cohort. There were also interesting developments at primary level, including the literacy and numeracy strategy, 
and the DESH program designed to target uh, supports and resources at more disadvantaged school settings. So there's been a lot of change going on. So the questions that we want to look at uh, here today and in the broader report is how have the quality of family and peer relationships, experience of learning and activities engaged in by nine year olds changed over the course of this decade? And are any of these differences due to changes in child, family and social background characteristics? And in particular, we're interested in looking at whether differences by gender and social background in children's worlds are less evident for the younger cohort than previously. I get into more detail on this in the report, but we use both survey and time use data. Now, this is partly because there are some changes over time in survey questions, particularly around screen time, reflecting changes in the real world. So time use can provide a good way of comparing like with like for some of the children's activities. Now, before I talk about children's lives and how they've changed, it's worth highlighting the profile of families and children because that will impact on their outcomes as well. We see a very significant increase in the proportion of graduate parents. So the children of the younger, the children of the younger cohort grow up in a, a context where their parents are even more highly educated than previously. But at the same time, there's a slightly greater level of financial strain among this group at the age of nine, reflecting the legacy of the recession. We've seen changes over time in the linguistic and cultural diversity of the Irish population, but there are also differences between the cohorts in how the group was sampled. Uh, the older cohort, 08, 98, were sampled at the age of nine. So they include a significant proportion of children who were actually born outside Ireland, but came to live here subsequently, including the children born to Irish born parents. In contrast, we sampled the younger cohort at the age of nine months. So very few of the children had been born outside the state, but we see an increase in the proportion whose parents were born outside Ireland, again, reflecting a more diverse society. We see a broadly stable or even a slight decline in the proportion growing up in lone parent families, but quite a fall off in the proportion growing up in large families, that is family, families with three or more siblings. We also collected information from uh, primary caregivers, mothers in, in the vast majority of cases, and asked whether the child had a long term uh, or long standing uh, illness or disability or other condition. And we see an increase in the reporting of such a condition over time. And this is quite a large increase over a 10 year period. We also asked whether the child was hampered by that condition or disability. And we see an increase in that too. So the profile of children and families have changed over that period. And we need to take this into account. So what I'm going to do in the remainder of the presentation is, is give you a flavour of findings from four domains looked at in the study. So family relationships, peer groups, children's activities and their engagement and learning. I'm going to first show their overall or raw differences. And then I'm going to say something about whether these hold when changes in family and child circumstances are taken into, into account. So, for example, if some things like reading to children or children's reading for pleasure varies by parental education, we'd expect to see a shift because we have more graduate pa parents. So I'd start off by talking about child and parent relationships, and we collected this information both from the nine year old themselves and from both of their parents. Now we see uh, on the whole that um, nine year olds are really positive about their family relationships. They vast majority report getting on very well with their mothers and fathers, but we do see a slight fall off over time and the proportion saying they get on very well. It's still a high figure, but it, there's a slight decline. And it's interesting is that a little bit at odds with what parents say, because parents report greater closeness with their children than previously. The mothers also report a slight increase in conflict with the children. We also see a slight fall in the proportion of families uh, eating together as a family every day, um, though the majority, two thirds, still do so. 
When we turn to peers, we can see that on the whole, um, nine-year-olds tend to have, typically have two or three friends and the vast majority of something between two and five friends. There's a slight increase in those who have larger peer networks of six or more children. When we ask them how often they see their friends outside school, they do so about two or three times a, a week, typically. That's fallen a little bit over the period, but that largely reflects a change in the profile of children rather than a real shift uh, when we take it, that into account. We see bigger shifts when it comes to children's activities. First of all, if we start by the proportion who uh, are playing sport almost every day, and this was reported by the children themselves, what I've shown here is the, the, the change over time, where we see a 10 percentage point drop, which is quite large. But what we see is that that gap, that decline has been greater for the less advantaged. So where the mother has junior search or less qualifications or leaving search qualifications, we see a bigger fall off in sports participation. So in the later period, we see a bigger social gradient in sports uh, participation, which is concerning. Now, this is quite a busy slide, so I'll explain it. As you would ex expect, uh, one of the biggest changes, uh, you know, over this period has been around screen time, the use of technology. And it, it's, it's about how best to reflect that. First of all, we've seen an increase from 44% to 54% of nine-year-olds who have their own mobile phone. Now, if we break this down and base it on the time use diaries, um, we see that there has been a, a fall off in TV watching or the time spent TV watching over time with a big increase in those watching none and a, a, most children now watching less than a, a kind of an hour of television a day. In, in, in line with this fall off, we've seen an increase here in those who are uh, spending time on a computer, uh, di other digital device or video gaming. But what's interesting is that when you put those two activities together, screen time is relatively stable. Now, it's worth pointing out this is a primary activity. We're not able to capture, uh, for example, children on their mobile phones playing games in the back of the car while they're being driven to, to school or, or those who are, who are kind of like eating at the table and, and playing video games. So we're not we're maybe kind of underestimating that a little bit. But what we've seen is more of a shift in the type of screen time than in the overall time. We also asked the children about how often they read for fun every day. Uh, outside school. And this includes reading a kind of like a Kindle or, or, or reading kind of a text online. We see overall there's been little change, but what, when we break that down by parental education, we actually see there's a fall off for the less advantaged groups in, in reading for fun every day. So that the social differentiation in reading for fun actually grows over time. Again, this is very concerning because we know there's a close link between how often, uh, how much and how often uh, children read for fun outside school and how they fare within school. We also asked about cultural participation. So this would be uh, participation in drama, music or dance lessons or clubs. Again, we see a slight fall overall, but one that's more marked when we break it down by parental education. And we see that there's a very strong social gradient in cultural participation, but quite a, a bit of uh, a fall off in that participation um, over that 10 year period, which is a quite short period to see a big shift. Now, we do find that those who are spending more time watching television or using digital devices are less likely to engage in sports, reading for pleasure and cultural pursuits outside school. And owning a mobile phone is associated with less time reading and lower levels of involvement in cultural activities. But the change over time in sports and cultural participation that we see is not fully explained by increases in digital engagement. So there is a broader shift. Now, turning to engagement and learning, again, we've asked the nine year old themselves about their school experience. And from a positive perspective, uh, we see an increase in the proportion who say they always like school uh, with most of the, the, the remainder sometimes liking school. 
we see there's been a, a slight increase or really a broad stability in those who like reading as a school subject. So this is despite the change in uh, kind of reading for fun outside school. Children are still positive about reading within school. But we do see some shifts in attitudes to maths by gender. We actually see, you know, in the older cohort, we see that boys were more likely to always like maths than girls. But we actually see that that gender difference uh, grows somewhat over the 10 year period. And, and that's of concern, um, you know, if, if there's this gender stereotyping of, of maths. Now, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that we wanted to look at in particular is whether inequalities in, in children's lives have grown over time or have they reduced as we would hope that they would. And what's quite clear is that the social worlds of nine year olds are highly gendered. And these gender differences have persisted over time. We see it across the domains of children's lives. So we see that girls have closer and less conflictual relationships with their parents. And that's reported both, both by the daughters themselves and by the parents. Uh, but on the other hand, they tend to have smaller friendship groups than boys and see their friends less often outside school. They're much more likely to read for pleasure and engage in cultural activities than boys, but they're much li less likely to take part in sports. Regular sports um, uh, participation among the younger cohort is about 20 percentage points lower for girls, which is really large gap. And they also spend less time on digital devices than boys. They're more positive about school overall, but less positive about maths. And as I said uh, earlier, these gender differences in attitudes to maths uh, widen somewhat over time. Even more so than gender, we see that children's lives are strongly influenced by the socioeconomic situation of the families into which they're born. We see that where families are under financial strain, there tends to be more parent-child conflict and children tend to have more constrained or smaller friendship group groups. On the other hand, we see that children from more advantaged families are more likely to be involved in sports activities and this social gap has widened over time. And we've also seen that social background differences in reading for pleasure have become more pronounced over time. Now, I've covered quite a lot of material uh, over uh, kind of quite a short period of, of uh, time. So we'll have lots of time for questions and discussion. But I, I just want to finish by saying something about the implications for policy. Um, this study has provided new insights into the changing lives of, of children in Ireland. I, I certainly at the beginning of this wouldn't have expected to see the scale of change uh, that we do actually see over just a decade. We see that gender and social background differences emerge early in, in, in children's lives. Um, and this really highlights, as the minister pointed out, the importance of early years provision in providing access to a variety of engaging activities for both girls and boys and across all social groups to try and kind of, uh, if you like, challenge gender stereotyping and social stereotyping in the kinds of activities to which children have exposure. And the two year nature of the programme provides e even more opportunity to, to provide such exposure. As I've highlighted, there are concerning trends and in involvement in sports, uh, cultural pursuits and reading. And these are all activities that enhance ch broader child development. These figures relate to the period before the pandemic. So we have just, as, as Anna pointed out recently, followed um, this group, the youngest group at 13, and we'll have the data early next year. So we'll then be able to look at, you know, whether the pandemic has worsened some of these inequalities or whether it has countered them. It's quite clear that a number of the activities um, children engage in require payment. Um, so there is a strong case for more subsidised provision of sports and cultural activities for disadvantaged groups. Schools can, of course, play an, an, a really important role in encouraging physical exercise during and outside the school day. But previous research we've done shows that there are constraints for smaller schools in particular around being able to offer a, a lot of extracurricular activities. 
it's uh, uh, really important that, uh, that schools and libraries continue to play a strong role in trying to reverse the decline in, in reading for fun we find among many groups and the minister also uh, mentioned interesting initiatives around the, the my, my little library and so on um we're in a period of ongoing revision of the primary curriculum which does offer us a potential to help address some of these gender and social background differences in attitudes to maths um but again it will be really important uh, that teachers are supported in providing kind of uh, maths lessons that are engaging for both boys and girls and across different social groups so i'm going to wrap up there um thank you very much uh for for listening and i'm grateful uh for tomas o'rourke who is going to give the 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 policy response and i look forward to hearing his remarks i'll stop sharing there super thanks very much indeed emer for giving us uh such actually a, a, a rich overview of what as act which is a, a really really rich report so i know you haven't been able to give us everything but i think it gives us a sense of some of those key trends and findings. And I know when I and my colleagues read a draft of this report first, there were there were so many dimensions actually of the findings that really jumped out at us as interesting, both positive and negative. Um, but I don't want to say too much more about that because we do have Tomas uh, with us. Tomas O'Rourke is head of reform, evaluation policy and statistics in the Department of Education. So we're incredibly grateful um, that he has given us his time here today uh, to share with us some reflections on the policy implications of the report. But more generally, I also wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge the role of the Department of Education in the Growing Up in Ireland study. They're a really, really proactive member of the steering group of the study, which is so critical to, to its success and indeed a key user uh, of the data and, and the research analysis that arises from it. So, uh, Tomas, over to you. Thanks, Anna. Good morning. Good afternoon, I say, to you, Anna, and to Emer. Good to see you again, Emer, albeit on, on camera and to everyone who, who's watching. Um, First, I want to congratulate you all, both in terms of the ESRI and the Department of Children on this research report. Um, it's, it's, and also thank you for the invitation to respond, because on a person which is a professional level, to actually have this kind of focused window in which to actually really read and pay attention, work the way to the conclusions and reflect on what they might mean for policy is, is a really important exercise to do for ourselves uh, in terms of how we take this forward. So I want to acknowledge that for, from the outset. Um, so these are a couple of thoughts that occurred to me, to be honest, as I read, particularly the policy implications, and I'm very open to interrogation, disagreement, questions, et cetera, all of the above in the Q&A afterwards. And please watch me on the time, Anna, because if I go over time, just won't be fair to cut across me. Um, one thing to note, I think, I think he's even picked up in her opening remarks, the fact that this is kind of a, a really good opportunity for a comparative finding across two cohorts in the GUI context, particularly against a background of very significant, to put it almost euphemistically, socioeconomic developments during that time frame. I think it's really important to note that and I'll come back to that in my close remarks, actually, in terms of looking ahead to the next cohort and about what that might mean for us in, in that light. One point I want to make at the outset is, if you look at the key point of the link between socioeconomic status and outcomes, in some respects, you might say, in some respects, this is not all that surprising, albeit that, as Ima pointed out, the shock in terms of the depth, perhaps the scale of shift. But even if the findings are, in some respects, not all that surprising, I think it underscores all the more how important this work is. Because as, as Anna pointed out, my, my division responsibility, I lead the coordination of Ukraine, but it's reform evaluation policy and statistics. And one of the key drivers of that division, and it's across the whole of government, obviously, is really enhancing and building on the, the importance of evidence-informed policy. So that while qualitative feedback, which might be euphemism for anecdotal evidence, is part of our discussion, this kind of work is really vital to actually either underpin nuance, contradict, et cetera, the anecdotal evidence we may be received from different sources, be stakeholder feedback, our own experience of visiting sites on the ground, visiting schools, hosting Ukrainian students, et cetera. But I think it's important, if there are people in the audience who might say, you know, what the comment I said at the outset, that underscores all the more the importance of this work, in my view, in terms of having a really solid evidence base, particularly over time across two cohorts, to, to show these are the emerging trends. Certain things are being accentuated, certain things may be balanced out, et cetera. But it, I think it's really, really important to have this kind of work done to the level of quality that it is being done. 
Um, and it applies, I've learned in my last, my first 10, 11 months of the job here in the department, even to crisis response situations like Ukraine. Data and evidence are so central to the policy interventions that have been adopted and applied throughout that crisis. So even the very immediate crisis type context, but particularly over time, and one will feed into the other, obviously. So I really want to underscore that point at the very, very outset. Um, the other point, of course, that I think I've been reading and listening to Emer, the, the fine about children spending less time on sports and cultural activities, as a father of four uh, daughters, two of whom are still in school, a bit of an interesting finding there, um, and a distinct and rapid shift in behaviours. But it does underscore, I think, the importance of the work in our department that we fund and support, such as the arts and char education charter, the creative education part of the flow from those, and really linking those into local community context. I'll come back to the community point uh, later on. The next point, I, and I'm not sure if I'm even framing this question correctly, but I'll come to the question first. Looking at a number of the findings, I'm wondering, do we need to broaden the scope of how we as policy designers and implementers across the civil and public service, do we need to broaden the scope of how we link into children's lives in general? And the re it might seem like an obvious question, but the reason I ask is that some years ago in, in engagement with the NPC primary, I would be made aware of research that really pointed the importance of homeschool connections and supporting children's well-being and supporting their educational outcomes. And when we look at the findings on a number of different fronts, for example, on the one hand, families eating dinner less, to less together more often, albeit you know, not a huge drop, but there is a, a drop nonetheless. On the one, and then some not almost contradictory findings, more conflict between parents and children on the one hand, and on the other hand, close relationships also being reported, but also particularly the growth in the number of friends. So while the number of groups reporting you know, one, two, three, and four maybe dropped slightly, those with six or more friends had grown. And it was that finding on the friends, not in contradistinction, but in the context of the other friends, wondering, when you focus even with the best of intentions based on other research saying homeschool connections are really important, which kind of makes sense, but there's research to support it. And if this research is pointing, we can't hang our hat on that hook alone, it seems to me. So I'm putting it in terms of a question, and I'm not quite sure what it means in practice, but I, I find it curious in terms of as a, as, a, as a father and a parent of children and how important friends are in their lives. I thought that was an interesting finding. There's also the finding on migrant children and the further challenges they, apologies for the background here, I think it's a couple of gone. Um, and the further challenges they face in making friends, engaging after school activities, and somebody quite aware from the Ukraine response. I was spoken that at the recent NCSC research conference. And again, important to the point, and even that context of migrant children, Ukraine response, that education is both a response to a crisis, as we see in the, in the Ukraine context alone, but more broadly. But nevertheless, and again, up to my earlier, my very first comment, all the more needs to keep the eye on clear strategic goals. And, 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 and it might seem like an impossible task, but these findings underscore the importance of that. Um, and then also important points, the importance of, of a whole school community response in supporting these children. Um, so we would have found on our experience with the Ukraine response, NEPS would have advised and other professionals that you know, with the best of intentions, not rushing to identify SEN need within a trauma-infused situation, because from a perfectly humanitarian point of view, the findings may not be actually valid. So I think that's important in terms of a bigger picture piece here. The other one of the finds of after school activities, and I think it's questions posed by the report in, in one or two different ways, but given that schools are probably not one of the largest universal services within, with, with which children and people engage, certainly between six and 16 and, and larger beyond given our retention rates, but how can schools as that universal service most effectively link in with and support community activities and after school activities? So we'll be aware, and I mean, I'm in the fourth position, we, myself and my wife can pay for activities for our children after school, but given the fines, the report and socioeconomic status and so on, how to make sure that's more systemically available. And that obviously brings into importance, I think I'm, later on in my notes, I might repeat this point, but the successor, the work to the successor to better outcomes, brighter future is absolutely vital in this context. Because, and, and, and there's there's no, there's no, is that a paradox? And there's no clear answer either, but the school may be the engine of many things in the community, but as the report itself acknowledges in other areas can't be the sole hook in which that hat has hung either. Um, so I think that that importance of, yes, it's universal service, after school activities are really important in children's lives. There are physical facilities there to put it mildly in terms of very clear concrete, with the pardon the pun, evidence of this fact. Um, but how do we, this, this, these findings really put it up to us in terms of the work on success or the better outcomes for your future? The, the obvious example of school halls, school gyms, the expansion of the summer program that the ministers have announced for the summer, uh, and how do we build on examples like that? 
So there is on the one hand, you know, the, the report cites the immense potential of schools in children's lives, but also acknowledges that there's a community context. So take, for example, in terms of small schools or teaching principal schools and primary, they will face really practical challenges in terms of workload and school management, school leadership. So whole community, but at the same time, typically you'll find those communities, the bonds are quite strong. So again, work from a position of strength. How do we work in the if we work from the finds of this report? But I was really struck, even in, 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 in my initial reading of it, community emphasized time and time again. So one thing I would mention in terms of people are asking where do finds like this go to in terms of the policy space. We are in the middle of an EU OECD project looking at a sort of model of school community engagement between teachers, parents, and students. Building the work done by the Teaching Council and Beacons, um, but trying to see what's an optimal model there for teachers, parents, and students to engage with each other at the local level, to build on models like the Lundy model and ask participation framework that they have, very important that children have their own safe spaces and times to engage in those kind of processes, but presumably they go somewhere and they go into a community of adults. Um, and how do we actually, you know, kind of, I think, draw from the work of the, of the Lundy model and so forth when they take their, their thoughts and their views as gathered into those other spaces? Are the models we're developing there appropriate, fit for purpose, building the model, respecting voices, but also participation and influence on decisions that affect their, their lives? And if you look at the Ukraine program response, for example, and the importance of community context there, the community response for it, linking all the agencies, voluntary, private, public, and so on, and of course, spining up to the national government departments. Um, I think that the stakeholder feedback on that response has been really strong in terms of how those we can, albeit for a singular purpose, build on good links there. Conscious of time, so the one to get to at the end is um ironically time so the report for example looks at how some differences seem to have widened this accentuation of differences over time and then it can be thinking about so often we look at reform in the system different cohorts and teachers parents and others will say wonderful idea but i haven't got the time to engage i haven't got the time to follow through and then i was thinking of the piece that the next cohort for for whom this study will be conducted haven't even been born yet and there's something quite arresting about that. There really, really is. And I suppose to cut to the chase, because I said, you just get to with your own children and so on. We have an opportunity now to really learn from these findings and try and implement them in a way that will benefit those children who haven't been, obviously the children who are alive and kicking, thank God, we need to not forget about them, if you, you know, not, not to put a tooth in it. But it's something really important that we have a real opportunity here for children who haven't been born. And we'll be looking at them, I think, as Anne and Imbro said, in 10 years' time. And I'd love to be able to say that actually, yes, the findings have, have the shift, the trends have shifted and it's in a positive direction. And we caught the finding. We really learned from it. So that's obviously a whole of government responsibility, but in terms of the Department of Education. Um, and that's it. I, I think I'll close on that because I'm conscious of time, and there's a few other points I have, but I'll, I'll get into the QA if, if, if uh, time allows. Moss, thank you very much. I mean, it's clear that you've read the report very closely and very thoughtfully and actually reflected on some of the things that, that your own department is responsible for policy-wise, but asked us all some challenging questions, I think, in terms of how we think about the interconnections in children's lives um, as, as families, as communities, as policymakers, and, and indeed as uh, researchers. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. I have several questions. Um, what I'll do is I'll go through them and we'll see how we get on uh, and we'll, we'll see where we get to uh, time wise, if that's all right. Um, the first is on um, the factors that are leading to a child being hampered by disability. Obviously, one of the very striking things in your early slides, Emer, was that growth in, in, in the experience and of people reporting that they, they have a disability, but also the growth that their lives are being hampered by that disability. Could you tell us a little bit more about those findings? Yes, and, and this is something that we've talked about uh, with the department um, as a kind of steering group. Uh, we were quite struck by the findings. Uh, it's obvious that there is a greater awareness of need now. There's greater identification, but we're still uh, kind of would need to go further to get behind what's what's driving this. Um, changes took place between the two surveys in terms of classification of conditions which means that we can't directly compare like with like and that that change in classification was reflecting greater awareness and greater knowledge of the need but it, it, it is concerning that we're seeing not just the the kind of increase in conditions but the the fact that children's lives are are being limited in some way by these conditions and i think it would bear uh, it would definitely merit further investigation 
Absolutely. And, and that's something we want to particularly look at in the context of the data that will be available next year from 13 year olds. So look at those differences between the nine year old cohorts and then see what's happening uh, when they're when they're 13. Um, Tomas, I don't know from your perspective, from an education perspective, if you think there are changes there with regard to, to service provision for, for kids with disabilities in the education system that that might be leading to greater. One of the things we're exploring is, you know, is it around greater awareness of disabilities? But as Emer said, then again, the the offset of that is we have seen an increase in, in kind of special needs assistance uh, and those types of areas. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think as Emer said, for the research would probably be really welcome in the space. I am mindful of my, my previous hat, the importance of the teacher-child relationship in all of this and the whole area of CPD, the, the code of professional conduct, etc. but the custom framework in the teaching council context and whatever about the provision of services. I mean, obviously colleagues in, in, the, in the inclusive special ed space there are places big to meet than me on, on the detail of that. But I do think there's a piece in terms of there's the people support, the special needs assistance, but we can run the risk sometimes overlooking the significant investment of the teacher in the classroom and the support and the SETs of special education teachers. Um, and our, what extra supports might be needed there or kind of guides might be needed there in terms of actually really overcoming what are very kind of strong findings in that report in terms of children's perceptions of how the disability does hamper their lives. That's the starting point in all of this. Um, and, and, and look at in terms of, again, that community engagement, the teacher, parent, child relationship between so important. So probably certainly very rich ground for further exploration and research, I would say. Yeah, th thanks very much, Thomas. And certainly we're interested in, in the changes that might be arising from the survey changes over time, but also diagnosis patterns as well as uh, actual increases. So I, I would say certainly that's an area that, that this report uh, points to as one, one needing further study. I have a good research question here for you now, Emer from uh, Carmel. Um, she's looking, she's interested in the differences between the two cohorts, and you touched on that a little bit in, in your opening when you spoke about the fact that there are kind of demographic differences across the cohorts. Um, so she's interested in how you've controlled for factors like citizenship and mother's uh, education and, 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 and the balance between controlling for those things versus the raw differences. Thanks, Carmel. Um, yeah, in, in, in the, the kind of complete report, all of the findings are kind of uh, controlled for a rich array of background factors, including gender, uh, parental education, social class, income, housing tenure, disability, and so on. So while I've presented kind of descriptive uh, charts today, just for ease for the audience, they're all cases where the, the kind of uh, the pattern holds controlling for all of the other variables. So anything that I've highlighted has been where we've seen real shift over time that isn't just do, due to a compositional change. There were in fact only a very few things that were explained by the shift in composition. Uh, one of them was a change in father-child conflict um, and the other was in the proportion of kids seeing their, their friends outside school uh, on a regular basis. So, you know, what we're seeing are, are changes net of those uh, compositional uh, changes, if you like. And that's why I showed the charts broken down by parental education, because you could see the shifts within groups more clearly. Yeah, thanks, Eburn. And as you reminded us in your presentation, I mean, 10 years isn't that long in social and policy terms. And it's interesting that some of those differences are as significant as, yeah. uh, as they look. And it'll be very interesting to see how they stack up at, at 13 as well. I have a, a question here, which I think is more for you, Tomas, in terms of how schools organize themselves. Um, so given some of the findings and how they've been presented and the trends, um, what's the role of school boards in managing those, those sorts, of, sorts of issues? You, you mentioned the school community kind of piece, and obviously boards of management are, are a, a key kind of governance structure in that regard do you think do you think there is a role there in terms of in terms of school boards there, there has to be somewhere in it now i think it's a, it's a really important question because our own chief inspector reports would point to some of the challenges that school boards face in government managing schools you know at a systems level for almost you know, the 3900 schools give or take um so there are definitely challenges they face because being a board of volunteers and you, they kind of the level of community engagement and it's a kind of a, 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 in a systemic manner that the reports find it seem to signpost probably require additional pieces. But then you'd step back and look at it a bit further. For example, the DESH scheme that the, the department funds and the homeschool community liaison officers are a really important resource in that context. And there is clear evidence, evidence point of the success of DESH at least beginning to in, helping to narrow the gap. 
Now you also look at things and across a number of different policies based in education, schools clustering, albeit for specific purposes. So it might be for teacher induction on the one hand, it might be for teaching principals administrative leave and you know, having a full time post across the five schools or the schools excellence fund that Mr. Bruton launched some years ago, schools have to cluster and the inspector would find that too. And then you layer on top of that again, the community response for conflicts and schools plugging into that. Now, I suppose post-primary to a certain degree we're, we're sensing more than primary because of the ETB being the key link there, but not only. So there's actually quite a lot of supports to build on there. The issue is what's the kind of um, way of cohering that? You know, again, if you're, if you're going to follow through this in a systemic, coherent way, great to have the positions of strength, as a, and I'm sure there are other people who could think of that I haven't mentioned, but clearly something, something to draw that together in a way that's more systemically reliable for the, for the child, for the young person, for the parents and the families. But at least we're not starting from scratch and neither are school boards go back to the question. So while there are clearly articulate concerns and the challenges they face, there are lots of strengths in the system they could usefully look to uh, as, we make it, as we try and respond to the fines of the report. Yeah, and I suppose there's very practical things in terms of the role of, of school boards around that. The use, as you said, of can we use these as, as community spaces beyond Correct. school day and and, and, yeah. and 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 how they kind of innovatively take those things on. Uh, thank, thanks very much for that. Uh, there's a question here that I love, uh, and, and maybe it's maybe it's for both of you, actually, uh, and I can't see who's asked it. Um, but someone is asking, are we a bit stuck in the 20th century in terms of how we define cultural activities? Um, and I think you point at this a little bit Emer, when you kind of amalgamated screen time and talked about actually maybe it's not that difference but I think the question is broader you know when when we talk about engaging in culture and how kids do that today uh, and the various ways they do it and I'm and, and they're including TikTok and online cinema and Netflix and all of those things do we do we need to break open how we're thinking about cultural participation uh, to, to maybe be a bit more responsive to how that's changing uh, for children and young people um, if I could kick off, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, point for for very well taken, and and work that we did with the Arts Council earlier, and I see Sean and Evreen is is here that we did explicitly name the digital engagement as as cultural engagement. So what I was talking about really was those kind of structured cultural activities like drama, dance, uh, and music lessons. But at the same time. I, I think, yes, we need to recognize the, the broader engagement, but I think we also need to make sure that children have from all groups, boys and girls and different social backgrounds, have the potential exposure to different kinds of cultural activities. Um, you know, and I think those inequalities are, are quite stark there. Um, they were stark 10 years ago as well, even before dig digital technology had penetrated to the same degree. Thanks, thanks very much. And, and Tomas, I know there's, there, I mean, there's obviously a lot of debate about how digital technology is used in schools to support cultural participation and other forms of participation. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that yourself about how we need to think about that in the future. I have a few. Like, I mean, certainly there's a very strong consensus in the policy space that, you know, in terms of a teachers' use of ICT in the classroom, you always start first with the children's needs in the teaching and learning context, and then you determine the ICT tools to support that which is kind of the reverse way of making the point I wanted to make. In other words, uh, on a person of absolutely, as Emer said, a point well made, there is a risk of us adults, you know, being quasi Luddites and not fully recognizing the, the broader understanding of culture context. And my own engagement, my, ch my own children, if I'm trying to kind of wean myself off the screen time is bad to how are you using that screen time? Are you using it to watch certain things, watch whatever it might be, or listen to certain types of music and so forth? I look at the broad definition and understanding of arts and creativity in our creative arts education partnerships. It's, it's another way of making that point. However, to come back to my earlier point in, in the mirror image of it, we know from the pandemic alone how important their interrelationality connections are in education. So uh, take, I fully agree with Emer's point, in other words, making sure that all children have access to the diversity of cultural activities, however they may be defined, however widely. But crucially, what do they do with that exposure? How, if they're simply being exposed, that's not the point um, from a teacher and learning point of view. What opportunities they, ha opportunities they have to talk to each other, to talk to the teacher, to talk to their parents? How are we scaffolding that? Um, because there's good, you know, I've seen some evidence, and I'll be in the political space in America, about typically your online relationships mirror your real life relationships. You, you rarely form new friendships from completely from scratch online. So the point being in terms of that kind of relationship piece and what you do with that exposure, the, the insights, the reflections on it, we can't lose sight of those either. 
wider, however broad the canvas might be drawn in terms of arts and creativity. Yeah, thanks. And I think this will be really interesting when it comes to the data from the 13 year olds post pandemic and the way that the use of uh, those kind of digital technologies transformed during that COVID experience, or maybe it didn't transform those experiences. And, and it'll, be, it'll be very interesting to, to, to see what the learning, uh, the learning is there. Um, there's one kind of question here for you, Emer, with regard to how the reportings, uh, reporting on reading is being, uh, the, the findings on reading is being reported and, and relying on reading ability rather than reading achievement. And I suppose the question there around uh, is that negatively framing um, children's innate ability uh, as something that is moderated by their experiences or effects of poverty. So I guess the question there is about how, how, we're, how we're measuring reading and, and the differences that emerge there across different cohorts of children. Yeah, I, I think we very purposely in this study focused on, if you like, the quality and nature of children's uh, social worlds, not looking at their outcomes. So we didn't look at their socio-emotional well-being and how that compared it over time. We didn't look at their reading achievement and how that compared over time. Um, and, and that can be tricky uh, to, to kind of capture, to make sure that you really can pairing like would like and it was also a period of a, a kind of very significant investment by the department in the literacy and numeracy strategy and so on but it was really to capture the flavor of children's lives within and outside school it wasn't intended to take a kind of particularly classed or a view of reading but we have found before that reading outside school um, does help within school learning and I mean, OK, maybe I am a Luddite, you can see the books behind me. So, um, you know, I, I think it's really important if if children don't learn that love of reading, whether it's on the screen or, or a hard copy uh, early on, I think it's much harder for them to come back to it later on. Um, and I, I, I think um, DASH schools, uh, at least before the pandemic, have done a really good job at kind of narrowing the gap, especially at second level and cultural participation. Uh, activities so I don't think it's it, 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 it can be ignored as, as a key driver of development mm. and and it was you know um, one of the things you emphasized in your presentation were some of those gender differences as well as the socioeconomic differences and how the different gender differences play out with regard to reading and other things um, and, and the minister emphasized it in his uh, his short input around the role of early years or early early learning and education, I suppose, on also the first few years of, of primary school. So I think sometimes when we emphasize extracurricular activities or, or those kinds of cultural engagement, we're not necessarily thinking about the youngest children in our education system. That sometimes, you know, when school organize ECA programs or whatever, they tend to focus on the slightly older cohort. So do you think there is a case um, in terms of thinking a little bit more around building on that work that's been done in, in, in suppose, the earlier years and, and the earliest years? I, I think so, definitely, because in other work, again, the work we did with the Arts Council, we did show that some of these gender differences even in being read to, but more particularly in things like uh, painting and drawing on a regular basis, engaging make-believe make games, that we're already seeing a, quite a large gender difference at, at that stage. So um, I think early years provision can certainly play a role in, in, in kind of encouraging those kind of creative activities i'm not sure what lies behind the gender uh differences say in painting and drawing i whether it is parents are more reluctant to let boys make a mess or something but um it, you know it, it's concerning that we're seeing those differences emerge early and, and and they are predictive then of later outcomes so it's i think the earlier we can get the better I, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily after school it can be within school or within uh, uh, kind of early years setting as well but uh, you know if it's backed up by after our outside school activity I think I think all the better. Tomas oh, on that question of gender I suppose in the first few years of school obviously we, we have single sex schools we've mixed schools at primary level um, I don't know uh, Emer, you didn't refer to that in terms of the schools that children are going to but um, what do you think we can do from a from an education perspective in the in those earlier years to you know to, to, to kind of reflect some of the findings around gender in this report I'm, I'm I'm a bit lost actually on this one, uh, Anna. I'm I'm really reflecting on on Emer's comments 
What it's reminded me of, and it might seem a strange example to be reminded of by way of answer to your question. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is the reflective practice in teaching and learning sounds like a fancy term, but it is ultimately about making sure we question our own assumptions as adults and what we bring to the child's experience. And, and gender could be, I think, a clear outworking of that. Um, but this example only obliquely backs up this point. And the example I'm thinking of was where I was aware, I'm aware of some years back in, in a particular school setting, but there was a debate when it took place between the, some of the, the, the various adults in the, in the classroom about whether or not the children should be taught to make a Victoria sponge or their own sandwich. And a number of the adults felt Victoria sponge, because that's a nice thing to do. But of course, there were some children for whom actually making a sandwich would be a massive achievement, number one, and actually be a key life skill to teach them, number two. And so in terms of if, if, if gender outworkings are probably the single greatest, shall we say, canary in the mind of our own gender assumptions as adults, the toys we buy for our children, the materials we expose them to in, in, the, in, the, in the setting or in the classroom, that piece of both the reflective practice on the one hand, but crucially managing the conversation. So in terms of, let's say, SNAs, teachers, and other adults in children's lives as well, and maybe in the whole health professional context, I think one we could certainly look at as a system, as a whole government approach, is helping to scaffold those conversations in such a way that we don't, that we do our best to make sure that our own unconscious assumptions aren't impacting negatively on the children's own outcomes. And there's clear research on the Teaching Council website, for example, about the whole importance of its student teachers deconstructing their assumptions as they learn to become teachers, because we are typically successful assistants as teachers. So that's probably a roundabout answer to your question, but I think it's something that has got me thinking. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a really, really interesting question. And I mean, and we can all think about our own lives and how we've engaged with children in our own lives. And um, and obviously, as as the department responsible for equality, it's something that our colleagues on the equality policy side are thinking about quite deeply as well. And and last year we produced a statistical spotlight looking at uh, norms around gender masculinities in society and how and what they mean and 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 how they play out. And I suppose some of these very entrenched things are are very much present in in all of our lives. So I think that's that's a really interesting way to, to, to think about it. Um, I do have another question on the disability side, Emer. I might just come back to you on that. I'm, I'm conscious we're, we're reaching the end of our time, but uh, I'll try and fly through one or two last ones. Um, what kind of granularity exists in terms of the disability data? So can you tell us a little bit about, bit more about the types of uh, the types of disabilities and, 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 and what's available there in the data? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the type is is classified a little bit differently in the in the two settings. But the ones that emerge, I mean, as as kind of the largest numbers, um, asthma and other respiratory conditions do emerge as quite large in both um, cohorts, and in fact, that increased over time. Um, that those on the autism spectrum are around three percent in the youngest cohort. And some of the other classifications are, are cashed out differently. And as Anna said, I think we will really need the information at 13 to be able to kind of like triangulate all of this information to look at what kinds of conditions, um, you know, physical conditions, um, socio-emotional, emotional behavioral um, difficulties and how they interact. But there is very rich uh, data there. It's just because this wasn't a focus of, of the study in itself, but it obviously came across as a big factor in the, the changing lives of, of children. Um, and I think that's a really uh, neat way actually to end our hour together because I think there's an invitation uh, from Emer there to, to all the researchers in the room to, to, to think about their own research questions in the context of, of the very rich data that's available in growing up in Ireland and obviously the, the value of having a longitudinal study like this is when people when people use it um, and so we're obviously very excited about the, the, the potential of cross cohort comparison now but we would certainly invite uh, anyone who, who is interested in some of those more specific questions to take a look at the data because as Emer says there's an awful lot more there in terms of what's what's possible uh, what's possible to do with it and we know many of you are uh, GUI is one of the most downloaded data sets in 
in the state. Um, and, and that's something we're very proud of in terms of the, the breadth of work that's ongoing. So just finished by thanking everybody for their participation today. It's great to see so many of you here today. I didn't get through all the questions, but I think that just speaks to uh, the interest and engagement uh, that there is in the room. So, so once again, thank you to everybody who did engage. We will follow up with those questions we didn't answer uh, over the next day or two. So, and if there's any others, I'm, I'm sure you know where to find Emer or indeed to find us in the department. So we look forward to seeing you all again at the eighth report under our ESRI partnership, which we hope to launch uh, next year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Emer.